but it's quite hard to see. Seems like a really good approach. It's good that you noticed that, unlike the transition from A to B, when we go from B to C, we're dealing with the same situation. B and C are about the same situation, which is coming to rest. So you did something really good that a lot of students don't do. You plugged in this number into your five variables. That was a very good idea. This is what you figured out from part B. Well, we should go back and put that into our list of variables. So what you're doing is you're using this list of five variables as your framework for attacking all the parts. That's a really good habit to be in. We don't need a sign here because times are always positive. Now, you also picked out an equation. I think what you might have noticed here is now there's, um, we have a, any, a whole bunch of equations that we can use because we know all of the variables except for theta. So there's four equations we could use, whichever one is convenient. The only equation we don't want to use is the one that's missing theta. Obviously, we can't find theta by using the equation that's missing theta. But since we know four instead of three of the other uh, variables, now we can use any of the other four equations. And I think this is a nice, convenient one that you chose, but other equations would have worked as well. So if you only know three variables, then there's only one equation you can use. Right. But if you know four variables, then um, you can use almost any of the equations. And uh, since you decided to use this equation, you actually did use your answer from part B. You used the time you figured out from part B, which is fine. What, what answer did you get at this stage? What did you get for delta theta here? I got negative 22967. And what units? Three. Because the seconds cancel. Good. What is the significance of this negative sign? What does that mean? Um, because our positive, because our positive is in the opposite direction. Good. We can be a little more explicit here. What this means is that we rotated twenty-two thousand nine hundred and sixty-seven radians 
clockwise. A okay. negative sign tells us not, so we have not just how many radians we rotated, but what direction. And now we can check whether that is right. Are we really rotating clockwise? Yes. So if this hadn't come out negative, again, we would have known we made a mistake. So it's really important to always make sure your signs make common sense because very often students make mistakes on the signs and a good way to catch those mistakes is checking to make sure that your answers make common sense. Now, I think it was good that you saw this wasn't the answer because it wasn't the units that they wanted. So then you made a conversion and it looks like you did that correctly. We talked about how to do this earlier. We talked about how there's two pi radians in one revolution. We put radians on the bottom so that the radians will cancel. And what answer did you get here? I got negative 3655.3 five, five, revolution. Good. Rounding off. We don't really have this many significant figures, but we won't worry about that. That's about what we got on our calculators. It's still negative, and that's in revolutions. So what does this tell us in words about the engine? That it um, did that many revolutions clockwise until it stopped. That's right. That tells us that it rotated uh, about 3,600 times before coming to a halt. It rotated about because revolution is complete rotation. You can see how this is more useful for practical purposes than radians. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know how to interpret 22,000 radians because I don't have a good intuition for what a radian is, but I understand what a, re what a revolution is. Unfortunately, oftentimes many equations work better in radians. So you use the equation in radians, and then to make the answer interpretable, you might put that into revolutions, which makes more practical sense to us. All right, so here we learned what to do when you know four of the variables. Well, that's, it's actually easier. You can pick any equation that you want. All right, well, I think that's a good illustration of how to use this systematic approach here. Uh, so um, here's the method. Again, one thing that students oftentimes don't do that they should is just write down the variables. We should actually write down the five variables. I think we saw how that gave us a very helpful framework for doing these problems and kept things organized. And then every time you figure something out, you go back and put that number in, like you did over here. Some other things that we saw that are very useful, write down the positive direction. Actually show the directions of rotation with little curved arrows. Put in the signs, because if you don't put in the signs even in front of the positive numbers, you'll forget to put them in in front of the negative numbers, and that's one of the traps you can expect to see on the test. Uh, and then you can pick from the equations. Like I said, this might not be an equation your instructor will give you, so you might want to memorize this one. I think it's a, it's a handy equation that's a little bit unstandard. This equation is easy to memorize because notice we're taking the initial velocity and the final velocity and dividing by two. So what's the meaning of this? Average. Yeah, all this is telling us is that the distance is the average speed times the time. You might remember from high school, distance equals rate times time. Well, that's really all this is saying. Angular distance equals the average rate times the time. So sometimes in the book, they would write it like this to show that this is the average. But I don't like that because that's not really useful for solving problems. For solving problems, you need omega initial and omega final. So this is the form that's easier to work with. OK, I think we made some good progress then on rotational kinematics. Now on your exam, I think there's a good chance that you'll see a question like this. That's a rotational kinematics problem. However, something else that you might see is you might see a problem that is partially rotational kinematics and partially other stuff, like torque and energy. Very often this will be combined with the other ideas as well, and that makes it more difficult to decide what to use at each step. This was a somewhat easy problem because it was all kinematics all the way. All right, uh, did you have any questions so far? Uh, no, this was very helpful, though. I hope so. Good. All right, well, uh, I think it's really important to go forth now and do more practice on rotational kinematics to, to see what the common traps are. But we got a lot of stuff to cover, so maybe we'll, we'll go over to torque and see some of the other concepts you need. Yeah, okay. Right. But we have to go over this first, like I said, because oftentimes part of doing a torque problem will be using kinematics. Yeah, yeah it's this background that really helps me because it's, it's easy to skip over it when you're.